Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, January 31st, we are studying Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 29. In today's text, Jesus brings his Sermon on the Mount to a conclusion. He gives several warnings to his disciples for their lives under his kingdom, as he calls them to build their lives upon the solid foundation of his word. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Sean Linnell. Pastor Linnell serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. Pastor Linnell, welcome back to Sharper Iron. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on again. So, Pastor Linnell, as we get started this morning, give us some context. We're here in the Sermon on the Mount at the very end. What what do we need to know about the sermon or Matthew in general that will help us with the text we have this morning? Well, on the program the, the past week or so, we, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And as we bring this section to a close, it's important to remember how and why we began. The Gospel of Matthew is written very early in the history of the church, around the year 50 AD, and it's written primarily to a Jewish audience, and it's written as a, a catechism, as a tool for teaching. It's not written as a, a biography or minutes to a, a three-year-long ministry. The Gospel of Matthew has a, a story-like quality to it, but it's, it's, not, it's not a chronological account of the ministry of Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are five major sections in the Gospel that are called discourses, and the Sermon on the Mount is the first such discourse, and its purpose is to encapsulate the teaching of Jesus, his message and mission of salvation, the life of discipleship, and his goals for the church. And when Jesus preaches his Sermon on the Mount, there's been uh, some speculation as to what Jesus intends regarding his statements on the law of Moses and his relationship to Moses himself. And I, su I suppose everybody's really kind of entitled to their view. But for our conversation this morning, I kind of like to clarify my position uh, so that the things we, we talk about make sense. Now, with regards to, let's start with Jesus and his, his words regarding the law. Um, I know that there's, there's sort of talk or view about Jesus kind of amplifying the law, taking the law uh, and making it uh, harder or impossible or explaining it in a way that's impossible. And I, I, I'm sure that, that that is an effect of what Jesus says. I'm not sure if that's the main thrust of what he's doing, because the Pharisees do that. Now, whether they, they do it rightly or not, I think is, is largely irrelevant. Jesus is not a better Pharisee. Uh, his goal here is not to say, oh, you know, this is the law, but it's, it's harder than you think. I mean, take a look at the Sabbath laws, right? God says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, no work on the Sabbath. And what do the Pharisees do? They, they create a whole list of things about rest, and they make it harder. And Jesus is generally against that. So I, I'm not sure that amplifying the law is exactly what he's doing, um, but I do think that he is uh, giving you the law and, and perhaps redirecting your focus. Because with the focus of the Pharisees and what a lot of the, the Jews at the time, their focus is, is that the law is given as a way for you to please God and that if you just follow the law really well, then God will be happy with you. And, and Jesus says, you know, that's all well and good, but really uh, I gave the law to protect your neighbor from you. And so let's, you know, briefly, we'll, we'll take a look at, say, Jesus is teaching on divorce, right? Um, he, they know. They know that divorce is bad. Uh, we know that divorce is bad. Nobody gets married saying, you know what I'd really like in three years? I think, I think I'd like to be divorced. I think that's my plan. Nobody, nobody says that. But what Jesus is saying here is that your conversation about divorce is, was it okay for me to do this? Did I follow the law? 
when are the exemptions for doing this? And really what you should be thinking of is how these actions are going to affect your neighbor. Because if you do this, this will be the effect on, on the woman you've divorced. And he does this with, with multiple commandments. So what he's teaching you in the law is that really this wasn't given for you to focus on you. This was given for you to focus on your neighbor. And the law and really the teaching of God is meant to bring about reconciliation and to keep you from harming your neighbor. So I think he's redirecting their focus away from themselves, which is the essence of sin, and towards their neighbor. And then the other thing that we talk about with respect to the Sermon on the Mount is uh, Jesus and his relationship to Moses. Um, I, I understand the view that says Jesus is sort of a new or greater Moses or a better prophet. I, I understand but I, I don't think that that's what he's doing. Um, Jesus didn't come to be a, a new or better Moses, and Jesus isn't comparing himself backwards to Moses. M- Moses points forwards to Jesus, not the other way around. Jesus is the goal, you know, not not Moses. And moreover than that, really, when Moses goes up on the mountain. Moses is there to receive words from the Lord and then to deliver them to us. But the the point of kind of what Jesus is doing is that he says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you, there is no intermediary. So Jesus is not presenting himself as the prophet. Jesus is presenting himself as the God upon the mountain. If anything, the disciples are in the position of Moses. Jesus speaks with the mouth of God himself. And this is, again, one of the things I thought was really great, you know, and you had brought this up a a couple of days ago in one of the broadcasts, um, and also say in uh, Gibbs's commentary uh, that you can get through CPH there, uh, he brings out this really interesting sort of thing. He says, and you know, in Numbers 12, 8, what distinguishes Moses from the lesser prophets is that the Lord spoke to him, and then he puts in quotes, mouth to mouth is how the, the, the actual words think. It says, so when Jesus begins his sermon by opening his mouth and speaking to the disciples, his role in relation to them was comparable to that of the Lord in relation to Moses, not Moses in relation to the people. And understanding those two things are going to be important for what we talk about uh, for the rest of our time this morning. That, that's a helpful introduction. I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the first one, just because it's one that I've, I've never really thought too much about. I mean, I, I, so Jesus amplifying the law. Here's, here's how I've always, especially when I think about what the Pharisees were doing, this is the way that it was taught to me that makes sense that when the Pharisees added their extra commands around the law, they were, they were making it keepable in, in the sense that, okay, well, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? How do I, how do I make sure that I'm not working on the Sabbath? And so they, they throw up all these other rules, and I know that if I do them, then I'm, I'm good. And so while it was, it was difficult, it was still possible. Whereas, whereas Jesus, and I know he doesn't deal with the Sabbath here, but he, he deals with other things. Whereas Jesus would, would say, you, you thought it was possible to check all these things off. Well, here, let me show you how it actually goes into your heart and, and try and keep that. But so that's, I mean, are, are we, are we saying that's not going on or, I mean, help, help me out with a little, with that a little bit more. I, I don't disagree with you that the law is, is for our neighbor, right? That, that he's showing us how we love our neighbor, but I guess I'm, I'm still struggling to, I, I don't know, is the other one going on at all or I, Maybe help me out. Flesh that out a little more for me. Well, I mean, I think you can do that, you know, but but the the reason that the Pharisees are not keeping God's law isn't because they're not doing, uh, and I'm going to put in air quotes, good things. You know, the reason that the, the Pharisees are hypocrites is not because they they teach laws and then don't follow their own laws. The reason that they, the Pharisees are hypocrites is because outwardly they are whitewashed tombs but inside they are dead. And the reason that they're dead on the inside is because they don't understand this, that the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice. You know, the the point is, I, I think, is that all of these things that they do, regardless of whether or not the design is you're making it easier so that you can keep them, 
the, the point is that you're focused on keeping them as if keeping them in some manner makes you better before God and certainly better than your neighbor. But that's never been the purpose of the law anyway. The purpose of the law was not for you to elevate yourself above your neighbor or, in this respect, above God in the way that the Pharisees try to compare themselves to Jesus. The point of the law was to direct you on how to love your neighbor. But since you have no love in your heart for your neighbor, it doesn't really matter what you do. None of the things that you're doing come from the proper motivation of love, love of God or love of neighbor. It's always been love about yourself. If your focus is on, I want to get to heaven, well, yeah, me too. Everybody does. It's a nice place. But when you're doing the things, you need to be doing them because you love your neighbor. Otherwise, it's not a good work. It's impossible to please God without faith. And one of the things about faith is that faith and love go together. Those are both things that the Holy Spirit inspires in us. And if you're not loving your neighbor, then you're not really loving God. So, you know. No, I, I, I think that helps. That helps. I think that's, that's a helpful explanation to, to direct where— why are the Pharisees trying to follow the law? And that's that's really the question here. And I, I think that maybe even goes back to where, where Jesus talks about, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So if I'm, if I'm following along with you, Pastor Linnell, then for the righteousness of the disciples to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees doesn't mean that they do more works, but that they're doing them because they've got faith in Christ and then love for him and the neighbor. And that would be the sense in which their righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes of the Pharisees. Is that is that along the same lines as what you're saying? Uh, yeah. I mean, if we're going to talk about that passage uh, specifically, um, um, but I would also probably want to then, after saying that, you know, go into things like imputed righteousness from Christ sure. and, you know, forgiveness. But I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. And we don't have to. We don't have to backtrack that way. I want to get into the the text we've got for today for Matthew chapter seven. I appreciate you you yeah. laying out that stuff for us. So I think that was that was a helpful introduction. So we're here in Matthew chapter seven, uh, beginning at verse thirteen. Jesus continues in his sermon on the mount. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. That's the text for today, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 29. Pastor Linnell, the, the text we have this morning starts with an image of a gate, and there's there's two contrasting gates. There's a narrow one, and there's a wide one. Let's let's start. Well, Jesus Jesus says, "Enter by the narrow gate," but first he describes the wide gate that's easy, leads to destruction. Talk to us about that wide gate. Why is it wide? Why is it easy? Why does it lead to destruction? That's sort of the interesting thing, right? Uh, Jesus gives us this image of of you know, a wide and a, and a narrow door or a gate. Um, and this image of, of the way and, and the gate is one that's really prominent in uh, early Christianity and really Christianity um, throughout. Uh, 
you know, the, the title page of Calvin's Institutes from 1561 actually has on it um, an image of these two doors. And one is sort of a, a door that looks kind of grubby with some thorns and stuff around it, but there's a, a crown over the top. And then the other one looks kind of nice with flowers next to it, but there's fire over the top. And this image of two ways or two doors is something, again, that's been used even by the earliest Christians. Um, you can you can see this in uh, the book of Acts with uh, the thing that Paul's doing. And then the earliest Christians called themselves followers of the way. You know, um, and this is imagery that Jesus isn't m- making up, right? Um, it's uh, teachings that that come from the Old Testament, or words that come from the Old Testament, right? So, like in the first Psalm, right? God knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Um, when we talk about Matthew being used as a as a catechism, uh, early Christian catechism, um, the the Didache uh, is something that we. Uh, should probably have come to mind. And um, the the didache or the the didache, it it opens with the words, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there was a great difference between the two ways. So Jesus's words here about this narrow door and the, and the, the, the wide door, the wide gate, really important. And uh, of sort of all of the images that uh, Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount, this is one that the church has has focused on and grabbed and used a lot. But interestingly enough, even though he tells us that there's this wide door and this narrow door, he doesn't tell us what makes one door wide and what makes one door narrow. We're sort of left to determine that on our own. And I think that there's there's a couple of ways to go about figuring out who and why these doors are wide and narrow. Yeah. Um, and one of the thing that we, one thing that we might want to say is that um, if the door is narrow, then the concern of the person trying to go through it is whether or not uh, they might fit, right? And certainly one uh, isn't going to fit if they're carrying all the baggage of, of their sins, right? Uh, indeed, this narrow passage invites us to uh, to to lose um, or to to leave behind to uh, to sell all that we have and uh, follow Jesus, presumably, right? Uh, with the wide door, there's no such concern. You know, the door uh, is wide and it's uh, wide enough to you know bring all that you have and and give up nothing, right? Just sort of come as you are, all of your sins, all of your vices. All of your arrogance, that big head of yours, you know, that it gets all bent out of shape when people forget to put your academic title in front of it. You know, you just bring all of that through. No worry about whether or not it's going to fit. You don't have to sacrifice anything because hell is an equal opportunity employer. It'll take all of it. Yeah. And I think that that's sort of one way to look at it. But when we talk about then, you know, the narrow versus the wide door, you can either talk about giving things up. With respect to your sins, you can talk about um, having a, a, a narrowly uh, constrained um, code of living, which I, I don't think is the appropriate way to view that, but that is that is one way. You know, especially if you want to see Jesus as one who is amplifying the law, right? Well, here is you know a, a law that's easy to follow. The the rules the fence around which the rabbis have put, you know, in this law is fairly broad in its, uh, in its approach. Or you can see, you know, Jesus saying, nope, I just made the law harder. So now the the door is more narrow. I I don't think that's the right way to view that, but that is one way. I think really, if we want to understand what the difference is between the narrow and the wide door, we should take a look at some of the things that Jesus says in other places, you know, like I am the way or I am the door. Really what Jesus is saying is that the only way that leads to salvation is through me, not you, not any of the other things. And we can take a look at that today, and we can, we can apply that in sort of a, you know, an anti-ecumenical sense, you know, uh, that it's not many religions, there's not many teachings, there's not many ways of viewing things. It's not entirely you know, up to us to just sort of figure out who God is and approach him in our own way, but that it's only... 
the God of the Bible, the Jesus who presents and reveals himself in Scripture and word and sacrament who comes to us. You know, we can we can view it that way. And I think that that's that's probably the the right way, you know, to view it. And there's, you know, perhaps more to say on that. But so and this is I mean, I think you started to answer this question already then with those those last comments that that when we look at Jesus saying in the Gospel of John that he's the door, he's the way this narrow gate versus wide gate, Jesus isn't, I mean, I guess one way to, to look at it would be, and I think maybe you, you referenced this, would that the, the narrow gate is everything that Jesus has just laid out beginning in chapter five up to this point, that's the narrow gate. And he's saying, you have to do these things. And maybe that's involved, but that's, that's not all there is to it. The narrow gate is really Jesus. Anything else would be the the wide gate. Is I mean, is that starting to keep that differentiation? Yeah, it, it's an interesting sort of boat, right? Because this last section um, that Jesus gives works wonderfully as a conclusion to a sermon, but it it's actually something that you would expect to see at the beginning of maybe a, a theological text, you know, like a, a book of doctrine. Um, it would it would serve as a pretty good uh, prolegomena, um, which for those who are sort of unfamiliar with the term, it's the thing that a theological uh, writer, a theologian would put at the beginning of his book or her book to um, to let people know why they should care and why they should listen to them. And Jesus here puts it at the end, um, but it but it serves sort of the same purpose. Jesus is not saying that, oh, here's another way that you can look at things. Jesus is not saying that he's another rabbi providing just one more interpretation on the law about how to make it, you know, harder or right or, you know, a hundred other different things. That regardless of what you think about any individual piece, that the purpose of all of these things is uh, salvific you know, in, a, in a, an eternal sense, it's not merely just one other way to view things, but it has eternal consequence. And that these, uh, um, all of these teachings are meant to drive you to him. And he hasn't said that specifically here yet, but that is what he's getting at. That regardless of how you want to view any of the things, if your conclusion doesn't lead you to Jesus is the door, then you're wrong. So. And and so then I think because here the door, the the gate, he says, the narrow one is hard, this one that leads to life. And so but we're saying that the door is Jesus and Jesus elsewhere in just a few chapters here in Matthew's gospel. He's going to say that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How how are both of those things true that the, the door, it's hard to find, but also that Jesus is the one who, who takes the burden away and it's easy and light? So in this in this particular thing that Jesus says, there's there's a a, a couple of words that really are are only used here. Um, specifically, narrow, right? You know, would be a, a word that's only used here. And so, if you want to understand narrow, I think we've done a pretty good job of understanding you know that. But the other word that you bring up, hard, um, you can understand that as difficult, but I think that its parallel passage in Luke gives us a better understanding of what Jesus is really talking about. Because what Jesus says in Luke is to to struggle, to enter through the narrow door, to, and what he means here is suffer. Entering through the narrow door will will be a path of suffering. This is akin to what Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount with, you know, blessed, blessed are you. When others persecute you and revile you, blessed are you who mourn. The things that Jesus lists in the beginning of the sermon, most of them are objectively unpleasant. And yet he says that you're blessed. Why? Well, he gives you a list of things, right? You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Does that sound fun? I mean, difficult. I don't know if I'd describe it as difficult. Sure, it's difficult, but why is it difficult? Why is it hard? Because it hurts. It's suffering. A life of repentance is not necessarily fun, you know? And whether or not you want to talk about that as, like, hard, it's not like lifting a weight. It's not hard to understand. It's not even necessarily like, 
hard to do in the respect of, of, you know, technical difficulty. It's hard because it hurts. It hurts emotionally and it hurts spiritually. It hurts because you're rejected by the world. You're rejected by people who are supposed to love you. You reject yourself. You're constantly at battle with yourself. You're under assault from the devil and the world and your own sinful flesh. And you live like that your entire life. It hurts. It's hard to enter through the narrow door. But there is, there is nothing really uh, trying to prevent you from entering through the wide door. You know? So I think when he says hard, what he means here is uh, that it's, it, it involves suffering. You know, it's, it's hard that way. Yeah, that, that fits very well with, with everything that he said thus far. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on Worldwide KFUO, looking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount this morning with Pastor Sean Linnell. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back. Please stick around. What an opportunity you have on Friday's Long Gospel with myself, Pastor Tom Baker. You can phone in and ask any theological question on your mind that you might not have had a chance to talk to your pastor about, and I'll be glad to try and answer it. Listen to Law and Gospel weekday mornings beginning at 930 on KFUO. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on behalf of Concordia Plan Services, Lutheran Housing Support Corporation, Concordia University System, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, the LCMS Foundation, and Corporate Synod, daily reaches out to our members and partners, working together to support our local, global, and international ministries, church workers, and LCMS initiatives at large to carry the mission forward and to serve each other in love. Opportunities to serve, lcms.org slash careers. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark Hawkinson, host of Moments of Assurance. Jesus said, if anyone enters by me, he shall be saved. You can help us continue to get that message out around the globe while there's still time. One way is to become a church or organization of the week. For a gift of just $595, your church will receive 35 30-second announcements during the week of your choice, identifying your church as well as upcoming events and happenings. And your pastor or a representative from your church, they may record those announcements or we can produce them ourselves either way. In addition, your pastor or representative will have the opportunity to be on one of KF programs. It's a wonderful way to expand your mission outreach and to help KFUO Radio to do the same. For further information, call me, Mark, at 314-996-1520 or mark.hawkinson at kfuo.org. Welcome back to Sharper Iron on this Friday, January 31st. We are studying Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 29 with Pastor Sean Linnell of Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. Pastor Linnell, prior to the break, we were looking at the, the narrow, the wide gate, and Jesus then moves on from that. So he's, he's talking about the, the narrow gate, and you were saying before the break that part of the reason that it's hard has to do with suffering and and perhaps maybe there's a bit of suffering then that comes up because there are those who would be false prophets and they would come as those who are wearing sheep's clothing but inwardly are, they are ravenous wolves is there a connection there with suffering what's the move that Jesus makes as he he starts talking about false prophets here in verses 15 and following so there's two things um when it says in sheep's clothing sheep don't wear clothes um, so that's sort of weird, right? I mean, I know some people put sweaters on their dogs and, you know, to each their own, but, you know, generally speaking, we don't put pants on sheep. So what he's saying here is sheep skins, which implies that there are sheep who have died and that they're under assault from these wolves. So when you want to talk about, you know, the hardship of uh, persecution and attack, I think you can see it there. I think perhaps the the more direct connection is if we understand Jesus himself, uh, 
uh, and certainly everything that he teaches, but not just, you know, teachings in terms of uh, moral teachings, but the teachings about himself and what he's come to do about uh, forgiveness uh, and life. If we understand that to be the gate, then we also understand why he makes this move to, to false prophets. Jesus has set himself up as the door because Jesus has set himself up in the Sermon on the Mount as God because he is God. If he's simply presenting himself as Moses, then it's weird for him to talk about, you know, false prophets. But if he set himself up as God, well, gods have prophets. Yeah. And so Jesus is talking about people who will come falsely in his name. This is something that he says more explicitly later, like when he's talking about kind of the end times and things, you know, that people will come in his name. But that's really what he means here. You know, when he's talking about false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing and they're false prophets that are claiming to be from Jesus. I think a lot of times we like to view this. I certainly do. My first inclination is to say, oh, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. I don't I don't know if that's exactly true. I mean, we, we could say that, and we could understand that as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, since those people certainly claim to be teachers of God's word, right? What else would a prophet really be? But those people openly reject Jesus. So it's, it's not exactly like they're coming in sheep's clothing. They openly oppose Jesus. They're not trying to hide or pretend to be anything. But prophecy... Uh, in the New Testament is perhaps more appropriately understood as preaching or teaching. You know, when Paul talks about, you know, speaking in uh, speaking in tongues, but I would prefer that, you know, you all prophesy. What he's saying there really is, you know, I, I, I think you all speaking in tongues and doing all that stuff is great, but you know, what would be even better is if you were just teaching the word rightly. And so here, when he says uh, false prophets, really what he means is false teachers and false teachers that come to you in sheep's clothing, these are really, uh, this is an anticipation of false prophets or false teachers who would come in his name, you know, later. Jesus is speaking in, you know, we'll say maybe 30 AD, but Matthew is writing this gospel in, say, 49 or 50. Everything that Matthew records about Jesus is really what Jesus spoke. It's true, but it's being recorded and it's being organized to address a specific catechetical purpose. And so we need not only to, um, to, to ask or to uh, determine what it is that Jesus meant, but also what the intent is of the author in placing it here, you know, and, and I think that that's what Matthew is doing is that he's saying, okay, here's all of these things, but I want you to be aware that not everybody who comes to you in Jesus's name claiming to teach you about Jesus is actually teaching you the right things. And we've seen this in the early church too, especially if this is written in 49 or 50, this is immediately following the council in Jerusalem. And so in Matthew's mind is going to be um, the, um, the, some of the, the, the Judaizers that are, that are up trying to do things in uh, churches, churches that the Holy Spirit started through Paul you know, there is conflict and false teachers in the early church after Jesus' ascension. And I think that Jesus is uh, preemptively addressing that in saying this about false prophets. Now, one of the things that he says here is that you're going to recognize them by their fruits. Now, for everything else that he says, it still leaves us with a question. What are the fruits? Right. You know? I mean, that's sort of the important. You're going to recognize them by their fruit. And then you stop and we're all like, yeah, what is, what is it? And you can list things like fruits of the spirit, or you can look back and, at what Jesus has said and you can say, oh, well, this is going to be, you know, their fruits. It'll be evidenced by the way they live their lives. But I don't, I don't really like that, that view. If you read the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus amplifying the law, well, then why not? Why not read that as you know, uh, you'll know them by whether or not they do these things that I just said. But if you understand Jesus as uh, teaching the law in a way that directs us back towards our neighbor and back towards God in love, uh, 
as he concluded that teaching, right? So on this dress all the prophets and the law that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. You see how sort of in the conclusion there, he directs that back to loving people who aren't you. And so there's, there's two things that Jesus means by fruit here. And um, the first is going to be uh, love of neighbor and a focus on reconciliation on mercy and on forgiveness. If the teachers who are coming to you teaching about Jesus are teaching you all about how you can make God happy, and they're teaching you about how, uh, you know, you follow these rules and you don't follow those rules and everything else, not every specific thing they say is necessarily going to be wrong. But that does not mean that they are teaching you something that is true. They're teaching you in a, in a true direction. You know, not everything that Rome teaches is wrong. Rome teaches a lot about loving your neighbor. We like to grill them about indulgences and, you know, and everything else. And, and I said, you know, and that's true. But if you look in the handbook for rules and norms regarding indulgences, what they don't say is, hey, pay the church because we're, you know, greedy and we want money and then we'll forgive you. Like, that's not actually how they present that. Maybe it was back in the day, but it's not. They talk about fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Almsgiving, like helping the poor. Are those bad things? No. Even Luther talks about some of those things being fine outward preparation. You know, not everything that they teach is bad. But when you put it together and you drive it towards its end, its end is not actually mercy and forgiveness. Its end is using the law to try to present you as, you know, holy before God. You'll know them by that fruit. The other thing then Uh, and this is not unrelated, is what is that fruit? It is very much their teachings. Are they teaching the same thing that Jesus did? And you can see this in Isaiah 8.20 and, you know, 1 John 4.1, Hebrews 3.19, 2 John uh, 9 and 11, Matthew 15.9, Titus 1.9 through 12. You know, it's their doctrine, their teaching. You know, are they teaching the same things that Jesus did? Not just saying the same words, sometimes, but are they actually teaching you in the way that he taught you? And are they teaching you to go to him or are they teaching you to look back on yourself? Yeah, I, I agree with you that, that here the fruit would be the teaching of these false prophets. I think that's a very helpful way to look at it. And it, it does, it fits in with this picture that you painted for the Sermon on the Mount. As as Jesus moves through that, and he talks about the, the healthy tree bearing good fruit, the diseased tree bearing bad fruit, and he then, I mean, he gets, he gets pretty drastic there in verse 19 that, that the tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And, and as he continues on, you... It's almost like he's move, making a move toward the last day. As, as, he, as he moves from the false prophets into, he goes back to the idea of entering into the kingdom of heaven. There's that, that door, that gate, that way language coming back up. As he continues on, when he's talking about those who say, Lord, Lord, but may not enter the kingdom of heaven, are these, are these false prophets still in view or is he widening the focus out back towards maybe disciples who might think they're in, but really aren't? What's the, how does he moving from one section to the next? The context here really does point us towards him talking about the false prophets primarily. I'm not against this using this to examine ourselves. I, I think that all scripture is, is good for that, for learning and reproof. Um, and I and I I think that we should examine ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to the same standard, right? You know, the measure which you judge, uh, so shall you be judged. So, you know, we uh, here are encouraged to judge uh, teachers or prophets to examine them. We should do the same thing to ourselves, right? So Jesus here is talking about, you know, a healthy tree bearing good fruit, as a diseased tree bearing bad fruit. And one of the interesting things here, and I don't I don't want to not mention it because I think it's really important is that you're not a good tree because you bear good fruit. You bear good fruit because you're a good tree. And you don't, you're not a bad tree because you bear bad fruit. You bear bad fruit because you are a bad tree. If we're looking at the outward actions of, of a person, then we fall into the same trap of seeing uh, whitewashed tombs with death on the inside. Because, you know, if Jesus is just presenting a better way for us to follow the law, um, 
on on the outside, then that that's really unhelpful. But if he's showing us how the law is uh, directing us to love our neighbors, yeah, that does actually make it more difficult. So I'm, I'm not objecting to it, but that's what you'll see. It's not just that they do the right things or they don't. Uh, it's not even necessarily do they say the right things, right? I mean, you can be a, a, you know, take a look at it from the perspective of, say, you know, a pastor versus a, a theologian, right? You can be a good theologian and, and not be a, uh, a good pastor or a pastor at all. It's hard to be a good pastor without being a good theologian. But the difference is, is that generally, if, uh, if, you, are, if you are an academic, um, then your focus is on being right. And yeah, you can be nice about it. You can not be nice about it. I had a lot of professors that weren't necessarily very nice, but man, I loved having them in class because they taught really wonderfully uh, and opened some things up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that its application is going to be great. You need to be more than just right. And whether that's being a pastor, whether it's being just a good brother or sister in Christ, yes, we should all want to be right. We should all want to follow God's word as it was given. But if you're using it as a bludgeon, is that really using it the right way? Congratulations. You're right. And you're also alone. And you've driven your brothers and sisters off, you know, like sheep that butt each other and use their horns to gouge each other's flesh. Congratulations. That's not really what you were supposed to be doing. You know, so when we talk about bearing fruit, yeah, it's, it's very much that, but it's also what's inside. Are you doing this for love of your neighbor? Or are you doing this to build up yourself? When Jesus says to me, or says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, I think that he's talking about that, primarily about the false teachers, but we can see this in ourselves also as well. And not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord. And this is also, again, I think specifically why he's not talking about Pharisees and Sadducees, because none of them call him Lord. You know, I mean, that's not really their go-to, right? Generally, they're like teacher or rabbi or something like that. But he's he's talking about Lord here. And he's not just talking about some honorific title that means sir. He really is talking about the divine Lord. You know, and there will be people who do that because how else are you going to pretend to be a sheep unless you're, you know, um, at least with your mouth, right, giving honor to him with your lips, you know, so you, you say to him, Lord. There's a lot of, 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 you know, preachers out there that do that. You know, but the one who does the will of my father, we're going to come back to that. And so he talks about, you know, them saying, oh, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we teach in your name? We cast out demons and we did mighty works in your name. And I can think about, you know, like the TV, TV preachers and healers that get up there and they, they put their hand on people's heads and then, they, you know, they throw them back and then they'll be healed and all of this. Yeah, that's great. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really sure that, uh, that you qualify as, uh, uh, a right and, and true teacher of God's word in this regard. So what? So you, you shoved some, you know, people over that had bad hips. Is that really what you were out there supposed to do? You know, and I'm not begrudging anybody for making a lot of money either. That's not really the issue. But what is your goal here? Are you actually teaching God's word or are you just fleecing people for their money? And uh, cause I'm not, I'm not so sure that, uh, a lot of those guys are teaching the word right. I, I've listened to Joel Osteen's sermons a couple of times, and I just, I don't know, something about him doesn't feel quite right, you know? I don't know if I, if I can't really put my finger on it. I think it, there was some Easter sermon about where he said Jesus didn't just die for your sins, but he also died so that, you know, you could, you could be financially independent, and I think that's where he lost me, something like that. So I think in, in this respect, you see people that are like, but didn't we advance the kingdom for you? Uh, no, no, you didn't. And it's not just TV preachers and evangelists either. I think you can take a look at, and I'm going to pick on the Roman Catholic Church a little bit here, because I'm a Lutheran and that's what we do, is um, you say, well, you know, didn't we prophesy in your name? You know, didn't, didn't, didn't we preach? You know, uh, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Hey, we even baptized. We did, uh, we did communion. We did masses all the time, right? These mighty works in your name. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Because if, if, if your goal here is, is not to drive somebody to Jesus, but to turn them back on themselves, that's, that's no bueno. You know, what he says here is that he's the narrow door. And he says that the focus of the law is to love your neighbor, not to build yourself up and to try to have yourself canonized. 
And that's not just something that happens for TV preachers or something that happens in the Roman Catholic Church. It happens here as Lutherans as well. You know, if your goal is to if your goal is to just make your congregation bigger, you know, and you'll do that by whatever means and you're widening the door, you know, should you should you really expect to hear well done, good and faithful servant? You know, or if your goal is simply to be right, you know, you've you've got all the doctrine right and all of the things and you can, you know, quote the formula by memory, but you use it to bludgeon people, did did you really grow the kingdom of heaven? I mean, is that really what you did there? So you can do that on both sides. What he desires is mercy, not sacrifice. And whether we're pastors or whether we're lay people or whether we're on the radio or no matter what we're doing, it needs to be directed towards love of God and love of our neighbor. And that's a very difficult balance to, to have, you know, and that's why I think the disciples at one point, they say, oh, Lord, then who can be saved? And he says, yeah, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So what, and you, you mentioned we wanted to come back to it. I mean, we've spoken a lot oh, yeah, more on the, right. the negative side, right, as to what it doesn't look mm-hmm. like. But Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So f- on, from the positive side that Jesus gives, what does that mean, to do the will of the Father who's in heaven? See, that's why I'm so glad you're here. I get off on rants, I start, I start wandering away, and you pull me back. I appreciate it. So, yeah, so he says the, the will of my Father, right? Well, all the law and the prophets can be summed up in this way. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. And I'm combining two passages there. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Later in John, uh, Jesus is going to say something along the lines of, uh, you know, um, those who, you know, who keep my commandments abide in me. And this is my commandment, that you love one another. But when he says that, he says, as I have loved you. Well, how has he loved us? What is, what is he doing that that shows us what, you know, love is. And certainly, you know, keeping the law on our behalf, right, is a, is a, a really important way that he loves us. None of this works unless, unless he does that, his act of righteousness. And if we're seeing the law in terms of following it, you know, uh, for the sake of our neighbor, uh, I think that that's, that's, you know, important. It's indispensable. But when he says here, the one who does the will of my father, what is God's will? Well, God desires not the death of a sinner, but that all might repent and live. He begins his ministry by saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who do the will of my father, those who who, uh, uh, approach Jesus in repentance. And perhaps it would be a, a a good time to just take a, a short minute and, and remember what repentance really means. Because repentance isn't simply just, you know, saying you're sorry, but repentance is contrition in one's heart, feeling sorry for one's sins, hating one's sins, struggling against one's sins, right? Hard is uh, the way to find this door, right? It's hard to live in repentance and to hate oneself every day, get up and look in the mirror, to examine oneself and to truly struggle against that sin, against temptation, against the persecutions of the world. That's hard. But also to do it in perfect love and faith towards God. The second part of repentance is faith. Faith that we will receive, that we do receive the forgiveness of our sins completely and in its entirety through Jesus Christ. Both of these things are are what the Holy Spirit does within us. But this is really the will of our Father. You know, so perhaps when Jesus says repentance or he says repent, maybe even a, a better way to understand that would would be to replace the word repent with believe. Believe. So, you know, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who who believes in me, not just the one who says it with their lips. You know, these people honor me with their lips, but in their hearts, what are they? And and that's what he's talking about, is the one who believes in me, is the one who does the will of my Father. And they're the ones that on the last day will, will find themselves through the gate that leads to life and not destruction. So believe in Christ. Trust in him. And as a result of the Holy Spirit, love your neighbor you know, and, 
and all will be well. That that image then of, of you the doing the will of the Father as faith in Christ, I think helps us forward into the conclusion on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is going to talk about doing hearing his words and then doing them. We got four minutes left here on the morning, Pastor Linnell. Take us into this this very familiar image that Jesus gives here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So this is it, it's really great. This is um uh, Jesus gives us a lot of imagery in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the only actual parable that's in the Sermon on the Mount. Um and um and when he does this, right? So he he presents that um, everyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Yeah. Everyone who hears the words of mine and and does them. <sighs> does them. Okay. I mean that's that's fine, but when we hear that what we hear so often is, you know, uh, I've given you all these instructions, now go out and do the instructions. It's not really what he's talking about here. To do or to, to produce, sin begins in the heart. He's told us this throughout the Sermon on the Mount, that sin, your outward actions are not the, the problem. The problem is what happens on the inside first. And then this, this corruption that gnarls at your heart manifests itself outwardly. But if sin begins in the heart, then repentance and faith and love begin there also. They're not simply outward actions that you do, but they are things that you are compulsed, obligated to do because of your love for your neighbor, your love of God, and the faith that you have. So it's not simply going out and doing the things that he said, but having his word produced in you and in your heart, multiplied by having the Holy Spirit work on that, right? So everyone who hears the words of mine and who does them, whose, whose heart produces, reproduces them, who, 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 who has this come about within them, they are like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the raids fell and the flood came, and this is actually really, uh, really great because you have imagery from Jesus from like Genesis 10 from the flood, um, only here it's the rock and not the ark, you know. Um, in Matthew 24, it gives us perhaps a little bit more of sort of like Noah and the ark, but you see this here, this this rain and the and the floods. And what happens is, is that even though all of these sufferings, even these tribulations that come about, the, these things that make it hard to come through the narrow door, you are still standing on, on the rock. And so then the sermon has uh, very, in a subtle way, and you look around, now become very eschatological. Now it's about the end, and it's very clear to see. And it allows us to look back at the door and understand that this is this is more than just a moral teaching. This is a salvation teaching that Jesus is talking about all of those who hear Jesus' words, who take them to heart, who who dwell upon them, who have them reproduced in their heart, and then, yes, by power of the Holy Spirit, having them produced outwards, that those are people who, when all of the things fall down around them, when the world itself rolls up like a scroll— that they will be standing on solid ground and on the rock, and then you know everybody else in sort of a negative. That's you know that's that's no bueno. They get swept away, and there is that warning there. But he begins with those who build themselves on the rock, because this is what he expects you to be now that you've heard the word, now that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. So, Pastor Sean Linnell um, is the pastor. At, go ahead. Well, Pastor Sean Linnell, we're we're out of time, but great great stuff today, Pastor Linnell the pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Blair, Nebraska. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithfield, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.